So now we've learned that the ICA and the CDA in their collaborative work with aquatic experts and scientists are really working very hard to tackle potential copper olfactory environmental impact issues through sound science, evaluations, peer-reviewed scientific papers, education, and information sharing. Joe Gorsuch, I'd like to ask you, are there concerns today about the possible impairment of olfactory in fish by copper still legitimate? Uh, In other words, does the copper industry still need to be concerned about this issue, and if so, why? We've had many successes in our science studies, symposia and educational outreach efforts about the olfactory responses. Olfactory impairment concerns are not the threat to the copper industry that they once were in North America. Still, the simple answer is yes. We need to stay on top of these issues. There is still misinformation out there and is likely to continue in the future. As an example, new scientific articles and media stories are continually published about the effects of copper on olfaction and the other effects of aquatic organisms. Public concern is continually raised about these metals. These are often prompted by worst-case scenarios that need to be placed in proper perspective. We are evaluating many studies and sharing important information with the global science community. Policymakers and public needs to be continuously informed about the aquatic life, water quality criteria, issues relating to copper. Part of this continued involvement includes the importance of the work with fisheries behavioral scientists at EPA, the collaborative project with NOAA scientists that Joe Meyer described, and developing resolutions that NOAA and copper industry together can accept. Uh, And I'd like to note that we capitalize on each and every opportunity we have To share studies with the international scientific community, the collaborative projects with NOAA scientists represents a significant breakthrough in a win-win for the copper industry and the scientific community in what is a government industry collaboration. Bob, I wonder if you have anything else to add to that. One of the big messages we need to continue to reinforce is that applying the latest science, much of which is ICA and CDA supported over many years, is truly the best way to protect aquatic organisms under all conditions, even when considering olfactory impairment. Specifically, to adequately protect aquatic organisms from copper, a BLM-based regulatory approach should be used to assess the potential for negative impacts from olfactory impairment. Bob, if we could continue the conversation, I'd like to talk about the biotic ligand model or the bioavailability model. Bob, what exactly is the BLM? So the BLM is a scientific tool used in aquatic toxicology that examines the bioavailability of metals in the aquatic environment. And what I mean by that is not all metals that exist in the natural environment is available to the organism, so we need to make sure that any regulatory framework or understanding of the toxicology takes us into account and not just consider all the metal that we can measure in the water as being something of toxicity or concern from a regulatory standpoint. So the importance of the BLM is there because water quality can affect metal toxicity, and we've known this for a long time, in particular factors such as natural organic matter, the acidity of water, the alkalinity of water. All these things have strong effects on copper. So this is important because we've known for many years that water quality can affect metal toxicity, in particular factors such as natural organic matter, water acidity can have strong effects on copper toxicity, as well as things such as water hardness cations, which are positive ions dissolved in water naturally. Uh, Alkalinity of water and sodium ions also play a role. The bottom line really is that failure to consider these effects may make a water quality criterion or a regulatory framework either overprotective or underprotective for a large number of sites where permits for metal discharges are needed. The BLM is really a superior tool to consider these effects when developing criteria. It is robust, well tested, and trusted around the world as the best tool currently available. Bob, how is the BLM used to predict aquatic toxicity, and why is this information important for the copper industry to know? Well, unlike current regulatory approaches, which we've had for the last 20, 30 years that are based on water or hardness alone, the BLM develops a regulatory criterion or a number, a protective number, that explicitly accounts for all 10 individual water quality variables that we know to influence water or we know to influence copper toxicity. So adoption of what are called site-specific criteria that are developed using the BLM 
will eliminate the need for the site-specific toxicity testing that would otherwise be recommended to address water quality. According to EPA, use of the BLM provides an approach that can be applied more frequently and decrease cost. So really, to sum it up, first of all, BLM is the most scientifically advanced method for deriving aquatic life protection criteria. Secondly, the BLM is a superior site-specific method because it offers a more robust explanation of all the chemical factors that drive metal bioavailability and is very cost-effective. And finally, freshwater criteria that have been formally recommended in the U.S. by EPA since 2007 are now available for states that are used. Uh, what do you mean by site-specific? Well, really, by site-specific, really kind of just it means what it says, and that the water quality at a particular site is what controls toxicity. Therefore, the criteria should apply on a site-specific basis. And so, in other words, the regulatory criteria, if considered site-specific, can be set to match the conditions at a particular site, which could be considered a discharge point or something larger like a water body or a segment of a water body. So this makes a lot more sense than relying on some regulatory number that would be derived based on the water quality from a broad geographic regional default condition and is much more likely to provide just the right amount of aquatic product protection at that particular location. I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the BLM. Wasn't this tool developed by the ICA and the CDA in association with a team of international science experts? Yes, it was. The BLM was developed starting in the late 1990s, largely by the efforts and financial support of the ICA and CDA with a team of scientific experts and with the support, from, of course, from the ICA and CDA membership. Since then, the BLM has been adopted and recommended for use by the EPA since 2007, as well as throughout the world. So in brief, the BLM represents an international success story and a collaborative effort between the copper industry and the EPA and other regulators ultimately leading to the development of a more advanced and accurate tool for measuring the bioavailability of metals in aquatic environments. So, Bob, if I could ask you a follow-up question. This is Scott. Does that mean we need to apply the BLM and test every single water body in the world? That's actually a really challenging question, Scott, and a lot of people are actually working very hard to answer that question. We've had the federal criteria in place since 2007, but really only since the last two or three years are we seeing a lot of what I would consider rapid activity towards implementation. And the primary way people are thinking about this from the state regulatory point of view is, well, if we have data for a particular site, we can do a number for that site and then leave all the other numbers back to the old hardness-based criteria of old. However, other states are trying to think more broadly on how do we use this to apply regulatory criteria to all waters in the state, and that's not necessarily a trivial undertaking. So the answer is stay tuned. Okay, thanks. It seems like the adoption of the B, well, adoption I think is a good word of the BLM, is having an evolution. Um, so where are we now? I think they're actually really starting to accelerate, and we're reaching a very exciting phase in the efforts that CDA and ICA have put forth in advocating for development and implementation of the BLM-based criteria in states across the United States. The technical resources and financial support from ICA and CDA have gone a long way and leveraged a lot of exciting activity in many areas throughout the U.S., such that now what we're seeing is many states are starting to update their regulatory standards to use the BLM. We, primarily GEI project team working with ICA and CDA, has developed and is maintaining a database of every state's approach and their timing for updating their water quality criteria, which is sometimes termed the triennial review process, although it rarely happens on a every three-year basis as required by EPA. And so what we are doing on behalf of ICA and CDA members is offering technical support to states as they embark on the update process, and the project involves direct contact with the water quality regulators in all 50 states, American territories, and tribes, and really most simply put, we just offer up the educational and technical resources to help everybody work through the many problems and challenges and leading ultimately to regulatory acceptance. So it really sounds like there's a lot of collaborative and current ongoing work happening. Where does the olfactory and BLM discussion leave copper today and perhaps for the future? Bob, if you could give a response first and then Joe Meyer and maybe Joe Gorsuch after that. Sure. As I think you've heard throughout this podcast, as long as BLM-based criteria are used, copper does not appear to be a contributor to the decline of salmon populations in the Pacific Northwest 
nor do we feel that any extra levels of protection are required to protect against olfactory impairment as studied and expressed as concerns by many parties. Unfortunately, because non-point sources are not always as well regulated as point sources are, research is still needed to determine how much copper can exceed the BLM-based criteria without contributing to population decline. And Bob, compared to minimally exposed fish in ultra-pure water in the laboratory, fish that have adjusted to elevated background copper concentrations tolerate higher copper before their behavior is altered or other effects begin. And fish can even recover from some olfactory effects depending on how high a copper concentration they were exposed to and how long they were exposed. So this means that tolerable concentrations of copper in many receiving waters that contain elevated background copper concentrations might be considerably higher than those reported in laboratory studies. Joe Gorsuch, what's the takeaway our audience should have? Well, to reiterate, the overriding messages that we heard from Bob and Joe Meyer include the concerns about potential impairment of olfaction by copper are legitimate and should not be minimized. Also, that Joe Meyer stated that the crux of this discussion can be summed up in three words. Water, chemistry, matters. We need to continue to work together with our experts and to make this information accessible not only to the science community for peer review, but to the policymakers the media, and other important stakeholders. Yes, Joe, it's important to recognize that water used most frequently in laboratory tests is ultra-pure water with copper added as a soluble salt. And those tests show that relatively low concentrations of copper can be harmful. But ultra-pure water used in lab studies is not the same composition as water found in the natural environment. In real-world waters contain chemicals that protect fish against copper. So, well, concern over these olfactory effects is real. The BLM is bioavailability-based approaches are the best way to assess and protect against this impairment because meeting these criteria also result in olfactory protection. And we know this to be the case because these models are the best way to take into account all of the different aspects of water chemistry that are important to understanding copper and its effects on aquatic organisms, and it's the very best way to show why water chemistry matters. Well, thank you to our listening audience and our experts. It's been very interesting to participate, learn, and to share new information about the significance of ongoing science research and environmental impact studies for copper. Copper and fish smell can be summed up as follows. The Copper Alliance continues its important work with scientific experts who counter the perception that copper poses a major threat to salmon and other fish species by impairing olfactory responses. Yes, publications by the scientific experts, the ICA and the CDA, have focused on primarily two areas of importance. First, water chemistry matters in determining the toxicity of copper and its impairment of olfaction in fish. Two, the discovery that olfaction is not impaired in salmon and trout when the U.S. EPA's BLM-based water quality criteria are not exceeded. Thank you, Joe and Scott, and a special thanks to our science experts and guests, Joe Meyer and Bob Gensimer, for their participation in today's podcast program. Who knows about copper and fish smell? Well, we do, and we have the answers to that important question. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I also appreciate the opportunity to participate in this podcast and to continue our collaboration with all of you, ICA, CDA, and your members for supporting the work and the ability to help educate to the scientific community and stakeholders and the regulatory community as well to better educate and move our science forward. So it's apparent that ICA and CDA Health Environment Sustainable Development Program have demonstrated that water quality criteria for copper when bioavailability is properly accounted for through the use of the BLM, are protective against olfactory impairment in salmon. Our joint advocacy efforts, including informing the science community through peer-reviewed scientific journals, articles, newsletters, symposiums, and presentations at international scientific conferences, are in fact bearing fruit. Our scientific activities in the HESD program We'll continue monitoring studies that evaluate the effects of copper on fish olfactory impairment and olfactory behaviors in fish 
particularly in salmon. Moving forward, we will continue to evaluate whether international water quality guidelines are protective against these effects. Yes, and as aquatic and ecological science experts have pointed out, regulatory concerns about copper criteria, especially in regards to U.S. Pacific salmon populations, still exist. The Copper Alliance continues to counter misperceptions by sharing the Water Quality Matters message with the science community, their stakeholders, including environmental policymakers and government representatives, educators, and the media. And we will continue to advocate that overly protective regulatory limits on copper should only be applied to water bodies in which conservative water chemistry actually exists. This podcast has been produced for International Copper Association and the Copper Development Association members. For information about olfactory effects and olfaction and copper, please feel free to contact me, Scott Baker. That's S-C-O-T-T-B-A-K-E-R by email at scott.baker at copperalliance.org. Joe and I will continue working with internationally renowned science experts in communicating clear, accurate, and scientifically proven data through studies about copper and olfaction in fish. Thanks for listening.